My name is James Bradfield Moody and I'm the CEO of a company called Sendle that does door-to-door -door delivery for post office prices by unlocking business courier services and making their idle backhaul available to consumers. So Sendle came from our first business called TwoShare, which really needed a very easy and affordable peer-to-peer -peer or consumer-to-consumer -consumer logistics solution. The easy bit meant that it had to be door-to-door, -door. like uh, uh, the members of TwoShare wouldn't actually line up at the post office in order to, to give their things away. Um, and the, the affordable meant that we had to find a place where we could get courier services that were effectively at a marginal cost. And, and we worked with courier companies and identified the fact that they're currently delivering lots of stuff to suburbs, but they're not picking stuff up from suburbs, so their trucks are coming back into the depot. So what we do is we fill those trucks with consumer-based objects, you know, sending something to your mother in Brisbane, um, or selling something over eBay, we fill those trucks and we get amazing prices as a result. So I started my, the business journey for Sendle in 2012. Uh, and originally it actually was through this uh, giving network called TwoShare. Members could actually put things on there that they no longer needed and other folk could re request them. And the secret source or the business model you might say for TwoShare was that we're going to fulfill the logistics. So the business model flipped around a bit and you know the, the typical Amazon or e-commerce business model is you sell something and then you give away the delivery for free. For us, we flip it. We get all this stuff for free that people no longer need and we charge for the delivery. And in doing that, that actually taught us so much around logistics that we realized that, we, that the service we built for our own purposes was something that a whole lot of other marketplaces, a whole lot of other consumers, a whole lot of other small businesses actually needed their own right. And, and so we made it available and, and, and split it off as a separate company called Sendle, which really was saying, why line up at the post office if you can get the same, uh, you know, can get delivery services door to door for the same price. So we currently have 11 people working for, for TwoShare and Sendle. Um, and you know, we're in this very interesting period of growth. Uh, we've just recently completed an investment round um, for $1.8 million, uh, which is really exciting. And, and now we're really building out the service. Sendle is in the parcel logistics industry, you might say, but a, a small sub-segment of that. It's the consumer to consumer or the small business to consumer logistics industry. And, and that's everything under tw about 25 kilograms, um, about uh, check-in baggage size is the stuff that we can, we can deliver. That industry is really interesting. Um, firstly, it's characterized by a, a large number of monopolies. Um, generally, they're you know national post offices or otherwise, um, but it's also an industry that's that's growing um, quite rapidly as we're seeing things like the sharing economy take off. Um, uh, understanding is as in, in what they, there's another concept called the circular economy, which is really about uh, finding ways and not just delivering stuff to people, but the stuff that we have in our homes making it useful again. And that means you need to pick up stuff from people. So so we find ourselves it's it's interesting really uh, fortunate that we're in an industry that there's, there's not that many other players, but also one that's growing quite rapidly. So the biggest trend facing our industry is actually around software um, and what software is doing to, to really improve both efficiency, but also at the level of service that you can offer. Um, there's, a, there's a saying, there's two types of companies, those that know their software companies and those that don't know their software companies yet. And, and we really take that to heart because we believe that uh, effectively a software and services layer on top of a whole lot of existing infrastructure is where you can create a huge amount of value. And we've seen this with other businesses such as uh, Airbnb, um, Uber and others where they're really putting a software and services layer over an existing stock of infrastructure. Another big trend that we see is, is really a focus not just not on price or quality, and of course those are important, but actually in convenience and, and removing friction. Um, we, we think a lot about this concept of friction in our business. Um, in other words, how, how can you create a service that's really beautifully tailored for the market that you want to access? And in the past, it's, it's sort of been okay to have a service that was 80% good, focusing on 100% of the market. Now that's being flipped. You've got to have a service that is 100% good. It's got to be perfect for just 80% of that market. Um, and then you've got to ignore the rest. You know, it's really interesting that Uber doesn't allow you to book a baby seat. It doesn't allow you to book cabs for tomorrow. And that's the choice they've made. They're actually limiting their market, you might say, that they're doing it in exchange for a really easy, simple, beautiful experience. Two big trends are also coming together in one spot for our business. One is what they call the sharing economy, the idea that 
uh, by sharing assets, we can unlock a whole lot of value that wasn't created. And, and these, are, these are all usually done by small marketplaces. You know, some have been around for quite a while, the eBay and others, and some of them are just emerging, um, like the one that we have, which is called TwoShare. But the other really interesting space and really interesting trend is, is what they call the circular economy. And the circular economy is, is this notion that previously we were very linear in terms of what we did. We dug stuff out of the ground, we turn it into a product, we deliver it to a home, and we stuck it in the bin. Right? These days what we're going to start to see is, yes, you might have to dig it out of the ground one day, but once it's finished with it with one person, it then goes in the hands of the second. You know, it could be either upcycled, it could be reused, it could be whatever it might be. And, and, and that, interestingly, this, the circular economy really focuses not just on stocks of things, right? There's all these stocks of, of items around the place, but actually on the flows. How do you get things from one person to another? And, and really where we see our, our, our company being um, really effective, and in fact, in some ways, our, our purpose is to be the logistics service for the circular economy. So I think strategy in a, in a startup is quite different from strategy in a large business because really in a startup, what you're trying to do is, is and you have to aim everything at, is what they call product market fit. That is much more important ultimately than your business model or anything else. It's actually getting a product that reaches some sort of market um, and, and, you know, then starts to grow around that space. And, and so if you, if you really start to decouple it, there's three things you've got to get right. You've got to get your product right, right? And, and again, you know, the product has to be pretty simple, right? If you're trying to do too many things, you end up with like too many products and it's confusing. You've got to really focus on one market. Right, if you're focusing on too many markets, again, you start to spread yourself too thin. But there's this really interesting thing between the two, which, which I think um, generally it's called traction, or there's a whole lot of other things, but traction is a really good word for it, is the roots by which your product gets to market. And in a small business or a startup, really, what you're trying to do is, because you're still iterating the business model, it's all about trying to find one product that can reach one market, ideally via one and maybe two, but never more than that, traction channels that really, really work. And, and it's interesting, really, it's all that focus. It's really hard because you've got to make decisions and you've got to turn things away. But ultimately, it's, it's getting those three things right. And, 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 and the flip side of where I see a lot of small businesses that don't necessarily succeed is because they might have four products. They might say, I'm going for the market of consumers. Right? Can, what's that? Right? It's actually got to be mothers aged 25 to 30 or you know, mothers, well, whatever it might be, you've got to really know what your market is. And then they, and, and sometimes they end up, and I did this when we started our first business actually, you end up following maybe seven traction channels. You send following search engine optimization and you're doing a bit of PR and you're doing some content marketing and you're trying to see if you can get viral growth going and so on. But if you've got five products and five markets and seven traction channels, immediately you're starting to multiply yourself up to 175 different things you could be doing and you, you never succeed. So for, for a startup, it's really strategy is actually about you know, focus, getting that one product, as, getting it as quickly as you can, that's what they call MVP, minimum viable product, getting that product going so you can get a loop and understand what your market is doing and then you focus a lot of your time on traction channels. How am I going to get my product to that market? One model that we find really useful is this concept of a traction channel. Um, in fact, there's a great book called Traction, uh, and they, they really pull out, there's, there's 19 traction channels, believe it or not, that a small business can use to find market. Um, and uh, any small business actually can theoretically use any one of those 19 traction channels. They're things like viral growth, they're things like PR, um, you know, public relations, they're things like stunt PR, SEM, search engine uh, marketing, search engine optimization, social, content marketing, you know, offline, you, you, can, you can see how they start to build out. But once you start to understand that, those different traction channels, and then you start to put some discipline around that, and you say, you know what, we're only ever going to pursue two or three of these at a time, and we're, and, and we're going to start measuring which one works. And, and the reason why you can only pursue two or three at a time is if you start to pursue too many, you can't actually work out which one's actually working or not. So once you focus on those, once one starts to work, you then double down and double down and double down. And, and the whole goal being, if you've found a good traction channel, you want to become a samurai or, you know, really good at that traction channel. And, and pretty much that, that whole process explains a lot of companies that are now really big names. You know, Dropbox, for example, really exploited their viral 
traction channel. You could get additional space by inviting friends. And they just got really, really good at it. So who do I look for to work with? Um, for me, I actually have the, my very first lens is, is more about their values and their basic qualities than anything else. And I've found uh, that um, the best people that I've worked with have been the ones that suit these values and the, the ones where we've eventually had to part ways have been where we we've, we've, uh, haven't seen eye to eye on these. And, and, and I can encapsulate these because I've used them so many times in, in basically about, we, we call it five H's in our business. Um, and they are in this order, and the order is really important. Humble, honest, happy, hungry, and high achieving. And it's interesting, the reason why it's in order, because, you know, I think they actually cascade from one another. You know, humility means getting your ego under control, right? It's not all about you. Um, it's, it's generally that you can have a good team ego, but it has to be, you know, your individual ego has to be part of that. Um, that actually, I think, creates honesty. You know, you can be honest about your own strengths and weaknesses. You can be honest with your colleagues. You can give direct feedback. You can accept feedback. Um, when people are honest with each other, that actually makes everyone happier and more, you know, enjoy a more enjoyable workforce. That makes folk motivated and hungry to improve and to learn. Um, and then finally, that's that improvement and that learning is actually ultimately what makes somebody a high achiever. So there's two types of decisions you, you make, and there's sort of the general day-to-day -day type decisions that everybody's making, um, and those in some ways, you know, you just got to get most of them right, you know, and then sort of you're on this pathway now, and again, you might get a wrong decision, and then hopefully you recover and continue to improve bit by bit. And then there's these really interesting step change decisions, the ones that really matter, like which market am I going to go for, or um, who am I going to hire, or whatever it might be. Those are a different set, and we, we talk about hell yeah. Um, there's actually three answers to every question in that space. There's yes, there's no, and there's hell yeah. And we wait, we have to wait until every single member of, of our executive team is basically at hell yeah for those decisions. And because yes in that space actually means no. So I believe that actually teams are ultimately much better than individuals at coming to decisions uh, if you do it the right way. Um, that their collective wisdom of a team, and particularly if you build a team where you know that you know, you're not going to be the font of all wisdom and that we, we can cover each other, is, is ultimately much better. So if there's a situation where I'm hell yeah on something, but some of my team members um, are not, um, we wait. You know, my co-founder and I, uh, we often found, you know, we don't, don't, didn't necessarily agree on everything, but we kept on talking about it, we kept on working through it, and then when we found the thing where we were both like, that's awesome, is ultimately more strong and more lasting than if one of us decided, you know what, I, you know, that says that's awesome and the other one was like, mm, maybe. I think there's two things to really get right at the beginning of the business. First is, um, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You know, if you get real clarity, like a lot of, it's interesting, the best businesses are ones that are built on solving a really clear problem that exists. And, and the pain in that problem ideally has to be quite significant. You know, the problem we're solving is Sendle is people lining up at the post office. There's a lot of pain in that problem. If we can solve it, it's a lot better. And, and ideally, it's also, you want to be the first customer. I've talked to quite a few people who weren't the first customer for their business. They saw a problem, they thought they'd solve it, but if you're not the first customer, you don't really ultimately deeply understand what you're doing. And I think that's a really important thing. Um, the second thing, though, is if you've got a problem, that's not just enough. Like, trying to find out what your purpose is. And really, what, what, is the, what is the reason why your company might exist? Um, you know, for us, we want to be the, you know, we basically want to be the, uh, the logistic service for the circular economy. We want to enable a circular economy because we think that there's huge positive societal and environmental benefits from doing that. Once you have a purpose, once you have a problem, and if they come together, then you've got, you know, amazing things to talk about with folk, you know, that they're actually saying that the team, your team can get behind, that you can get behind. It's the, you know, startups are, are long journeys, very long journeys, and those are the things that keep you focused and, and keep you motivated on that long journey. One of my very early business partners actually used to have a saying um, when, when things were difficult, he said, this is the point when other people would give up. All right? And the whole point being that if you don't give up at this point, you are creating value. Right? You've created value when things get tough 
and you've seen it through, then you've actually created value where, you know, another 10 folk might have actually said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. So for me, that's, that's how you motivate yourself when you're, when you're in learning opportunities or, you know, periods when it's difficult. It's, it's, you know, how do I build off this? How do I learn from that and, 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 and take it to the next step? Bill George, who's, a, who's at Harvard University, has a saying, um, which is, follow your compass, not your clock. And what he's really saying there is that, you know, find the thing that you're passionate about, right? And then start working in that direction. But don't get too worried about the amount of time. Because sometimes if you try to take too many shortcuts, you actually don't have the lessons that, you're, that you need to have. It's interesting, for a startup, generally what folk do is they invest in you. They don't actually invest in the business. I mean, it's got to have a good business and, and, and once you've found product market fit, it's even better, but they're actually investing in the people. And, and so really, the first thing you have to do is start to invest in yourself. If, you, if you're passionate about a space, you've got to learn everything about that space. You've got to know more, you know, in the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours in that space. You know, have you done your 10,000 hours? Because there's going to be some people who have. Um, and it's really that. It's follow your compass, not your clock.